Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. My name is Dave Lorenzo, and I only bring you the best guests. You know that because you come back here every day. Well, today we're going to talk about what it takes to be a litigator at the top of one's game. Now, you may think to yourself, hey, I watch Law and Order. I know what those guys do. They go, you know, those folks do. They go to court, they come back from court, they go to their office, they complain about the judge and they drink scotch. Well, although I think that is probably part of the job, <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that. And we have the perfect person to ask about that. We have the perfect person to ask about difficult cases, about cases that have a lot of moving parts and about cases that involve an enormous amount of pressure from the part on the part of the lawyer, but also things that are at stake. We're talking about bet the company litigation. We're talking about complex commercial litigation. And my guest today is Gerald Meyer. So please join me in welcoming Gerald to the Inside BS Show. Gerald, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you being here. Of course. Thanks for having me, Dave. All Glad right, so I gotta ask you about this term because uh, I've never met a litigator who says, I only do easy commercial litigation, right? So let, talk to me about your definition of complex commercial litigation, because if anybody should know, you should. What is complex commercial litigation? Yeah, absolutely. So I, it really is a big umbrella term. And for, for us, it means uh, complex financial transactions. It can mean um, intellectual property litigation. Uh, it can mean um, white collar criminal defense litigation, uh, especially uh, litigation you know surrounding uh, you know financial transactions, financial fraud, uh, things of that nature. Um, but but generally, it it really is a big umbrella, and and it means um, you know it can mean novel cases too. I mean we we handle. Um, a lot of uh, cases where there's really just not a lot of precedent for it, uh, things that are coming up in the courts for the very first time. Um, so it, it is a big umbrella term, and I think that can make it <laughs> a little bit uh, you know, confusing, as you pointed out. But really, it, what it means is um, litigation uh, where the stakes are high, um, where the law may be unclear, um, and where the nature of the transaction or the nature of the dispute is something that requires, um, you know, a certain amount of expertise um, and a certain amount of digging to really get to the bottom of what happened. I think that's a great explanation. So you're, you're, you're heading into uncharted territory from a, from a law standpoint, right? There's probably not a lot of, in, in some cases, there's probably not a lot of case law that you can rely on. So you might be making new case law and, or bet the company, right? So people are, people are putting their their livelihood at risk and or the the person's personal freedom like in white collar uh, matters may be at risk or their ability to practice or their ability to operate or their ability to make money the way they were making money at minimum so high risk high stakes um you know a lot at risk and perhaps even breaking new ground from a legal standpoint that's absolutely right. all right so this is what you do for for a living how in the world did you did you get into this did you did you you know leave law school and go give me the toughest case you got what how did you how did you decide to uh to get into this area sure you know well my some people do have a straight path into this area my path wasn't so straight so coming out of law school um i i was fortunate enough to clerk um uh, I was a judicial law clerk, so I worked for a federal judge out on the Ninth Circuit in Seattle, um, and and that was a really you know great experience for me. Got just exposed to really wide variety of cases, um, and and being out there you know in the federal court and on the coast, uh, there there's really just no limit to the <laughs> variety of cases um, that you can handle. So so I went from um, you know I went from that clerkship to Skadden Arps, um, big white shoe law firm based in New York, one of the largest um, in the world, um, and really, really great firm, strong reputation. I was a deal lawyer at Skadden, so I was doing a lot of transactions um, and, and helping uh, you know, companies make deals, uh, helping individuals um, 
with you know certain tax planning, kind of international transactions, just a really uh, wide variety of you know different kinds of financial transactions. Um, and what I really wanted to do, I did that for a couple of years, and what I really wanted to do was then to switch into uh, more of a litigation practice um, because I realized. You know, after clerking and after being at SCAD and doing deal work for a couple of years, that what I really wanted to do was uh, flex a little bit more creativity and and really get to know my clients on a more personal level and be able to advocate for them and tell their stories. And so that's why I transitioned to a litigation role, because what we do in litigation um, that you really don't get to do as a transactional attorney, you know, we still get to dig into the details, the kind of nitty gritty, um, you know, complex details of a business or of a transaction or, um, you know, whatever it is. But uh, what we don't get to do is really understand the client, understand their problems, and and really advocate for them, help tell their story. Um, when you're a deal lawyer, you get to know your client, <laughs> you, know, you get to understand their business, um, but you're helping them, you know, move the ball forward. You're helping them do something that they've already decided they want to do. When you're in litigation, generally you're helping them uh, when something has gone wrong, um, and you're helping them do something that they don't really want to do uh, because nobody really loves going to court. Uh, nobody really loves litigating. It's not, uh, it's not very much fun uh, really for either side. It's, uh, it's really problem solving. Okay. Now tell us a little bit about how being in transactional work at the beginning of your career informs you now as a litigator. Does, is it, does that help you? Does that give you a competitive advantage? Yeah, absolutely. It does. So, you know, the transactions at that level, you know, when, when you're a scat and arps, the transactions you're dealing with are, are so very complex that, you know, understanding the nuts and bolts of them, you know, how they work, all the securities filings that, you know, um, have to be made in connection with, you know, certain of these deals, um, really just how to read how to pick up and read a 250 page contract um, and really kind of digest it and understand it uh, in a reasonable amount of time because uh, we don't always have months to figure these things out. Uh, that's th Those are all skills that deal attorneys develop very, very early in their careers. It's like, hey, how does this, how does this thing work? Um, th this impenetrable document that uh, is very, very dense, very, very confusing, written in a way that <laughs> no, you know, no English speaker is going to look at this and, and really understand what it means. Um, but uh, but those are the skills you develop early on. So having those skills, bringing those skills to the table, um, you know, as a litigator, uh, you know, I think is a huge advantage because uh, because you do have the ability to then just kind of pick up a document. You know, there's a transaction that went bad. Um, you know, I can pick up the document and, and just kind of know how to attack it. Um, you know, right away in a way that people who haven't done that work before, you know, they don't necessarily have that skill. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the ways that I've often heard it described and I want to see if this resonates with you is, you know, uh, here's a clumsy sports analogy folks. So prepare yourselves. If you're, you know, you're watching, uh, you're watching an NFL game film and you're a defensive coordinator, you can, you can watch the plays that the offense that you're going to play is running. And even though the plays to the, to the naked eye, to the untrained professional look fantastic and that some of them work and some of them don't as a defensive coordinator, who's seen these things over and over and over again, you know how to stop all that stuff. It's just a matter of you figuring out when to apply which tool and how to apply it and where to apply it. But you've seen, you've seen these things before. So you know what you're looking at and you're looking at it with, you know, more trained, uh, really focused eyes. Does that, does that make sense? Is that a, is that a description? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good analogy. All right. So, so now you've got these skills. You you've been able to handle. Um, you've been you've been you've been uh, in real you know uh, intense transactional work. You've also uh, now let's say you're you're a couple of years into uh, into litigation and you're working on litigation. Where does the where does the white collar uh, criminal defense come in? Did you did you just stumble upon some bad guys in your in your corporate litigation work? How did you or did you intentionally uh, focus on honing those skills as well? 
I was very uh, focused on honing those skills. So I had a little transition time between my time at, at Skadden as a transactional attorney and my time uh, when I started at Mobile Lampkin um, and started litigating. I, I took another uh, federal clerkship out on the Fourth Circuit and um, out, in, out in Virginia for you know another really fantastic judge. And so I look, I was very, very fortunate early in my career that I had the opportunity to work for two you know really incredible federal judges um, and just just learn a ton from them. So being in those clerkships, you know, you touch a lot of criminal work. Uh, um, you know, I'd say maybe roughly half the docket, you know, just very close to it, was criminal work. Um, and so seeing those cases and kind of understanding those cases, uh, you know, they're, they're very, very interesting. Um, and, and they can be very, very complex. And it really doesn't get more high stakes than, you know, a criminal case where somebody's uh, liberty is on the line. Um, you know, it's it's one thing when you're litigating over money, and it's another thing when you're litigating over you know somebody's freedom. So, um, so it it was something that's very very interesting to me, and it does dovetail really well with a um, you know with a civil practice that focuses on complex you know commercial litigation because when you have people who are out there committing uh, things like securities fraud, um, Medicare fraud. Um, you know, any kind of billing fraud, you know, submitting false claims to, to the government, um, things of that nature, uh, bank fraud, wire fraud, um, really any, any time when people are, you know, using, uh, you know, illicit means and, you, you know, really using paper, using deals to try to get money uh, that they, you know, other, shouldn't get. Um, that's, you know, it's that same skill set that kind of applies. So, uh, you know, early, early on in my litigation career, had this um, uh, represented a uh, physician who was accused of, um, you know, receiving kickbacks and and you know committing some Medicare fraud and uh, ended up having a, a six week trial, um, you know, right within the first kind of two years of my litigation practice. So really, you know, building those skills that I built up and was able to apply to that, yeah, they they still apply because you know I'm looking at these you know, med medical bills, you know, I'm going through these forms, trying to understand, hey, how was this all put together? How, how did this all work? How did this hospital structure its practice? Um, and really kind of thinking about those issues, but then at the same time, uh, got to apply the skills that I didn't get to apply as a transactional attorney, get to sit down with my client and talk to him and get to know him and get to know his family, get to understand his story and, and figure out how to tell his story, how to advocate for him. So explain to folks the um, the difference between working on a, a case that's a paper case versus a case that's circumstantial, right? So people don't, I don't think people understand that if there's evidence and it's written and there's a paper trail and you're defending, that's a much tougher case to defend than a circumstantial case. So, I, I mean, that's, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm reading into it as a non-lawyer. Is that, is that a correct assumption? You know, it can be. Uh, it's interesting because people's takes on paper documents, um, you know, really kind of vary. You don't necessarily know what somebody intended when they wrote something, um, and you don't necessarily know when something created somebody created the paper trail just to just for cover. Um, and those things happen. So, you know, what's really interesting, and I think you know, a really common misconception among non-lawyers is that you know, evidence is paper evidence. You know, and then testimony is not evidence or that's just something somebody said it's all evidence you know uh, uh you there there are plenty of people uh sitting in you know prison right now who are there based solely on mm -hmm. eyewitness testimony um and and so you know somebody said something that's that's competent evidence um if they you know take the stand and testify to it so it can it be more difficult to defend a paper case it can um, it can be very hard to challenge eyewitness testimony too. It's, it's really, it's really a big, um, you know, it, it, it's a big challenge. It takes different strategies, mm -hmm. um, certainly, but, uh, I, I, you know, it's, I wouldn't necessarily say that one's, uh, inherently harder than the other. It really just depends yeah. on the case. Yeah. Okay. Talk about the, the emotional toll on the lawyer and uh, how 
it it is or is not different in a case where you're where you're you know in representing an individual whose whose freedom may be on the line versus you know, you still do a lot of high stakes litigation on the corporate side, and I'm sure that can get emotional, but is there a difference for you as the attorney when you're representing an individual versus when you're representing a company? There, there can be, um, you know, honestly, what I find is that getting to know the people within the company, even if it's a, you know, even if it's a large company, um, you know, it's really the, it's really the same. Right? These people, your clients when you work with them for a long time you know they become your friends um and and you know ultimately companies are really just it's just a group of people um and lawsuits tend to revolve around a small number of those people you know even when it's a you know even when it's a company that's involved in the litigation uh it's something that somebody did (laughs) that landed them there um and it may be something that a few somebody's did that that created the problem but but getting to know those people um getting to understand them and and talking to them i mean that's that's really um it really creates a connection whether or not the named client is a company or a individual now give a take us inside inside the room where it happens to quote hamilton right take us inside the room where it happens and when you're give us a a couple of examples of really tough conversations that you had to have where you know you had to talk about settlement with somebody who was completely in the right but it was you weren't sure how it was going to go or it might go your way but it was just going to be so expensive that the client you know couldn't withstand the you know the process because the 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 financial aspect was just going to be so burdensome or when somebody had to make a deal in a case where there was a chance that they they might be cleared, but you just felt like the making the deal was the best thing. Give us give us a sense for what it's like for you as the advocate to have to sit down with a client and say, We're gonna have to have a tough conversation. You're gonna have to make a decision. And my recommendation is not what you were hoping for. Talk to us about Take us into that room. Talk to us about how you approach that conversation. Sure thing. I, I'm going to be a, just a little bit vague. Yeah, yeah. I, I do don't have, want you to reveal uh, any confidences. <laughs> so you know, Mr. Yeah. or Mrs. X is fine or whatever, and you know, they can you can change Great. the you know change the industry or or whatever to make it better. Sure, but look, the reality is that those those difficult conversations happen all the time, uh, and it's it's rarely the case that your expectations going in, you know, that, that our expectations going into the case, the client's expectations going into the case, um, that those simply never change. Or the facts that we understand them as the at, at the outset of the case, that that's just, that, that never changes. That, that never, ever, ever happens. Um, instead, what often happens is after several conversations with the client, uh, you realize, oh, wait, there's actually something that uh, you told me happened that never really happened, or there's something you told me didn't happen that well actually it did happen, and so you know there's a lot of there's a lot of trust building that has to happen between you know a lawyer and the client. So so what I find is invaluable is having that personal relationship uh, with the client, having that personal relationship with um, you know some of the key witnesses who are on our client side just really really talking to them understanding them getting to know uh getting to know them pretty well and and making sure that you know they understand like hey we're we're on the same side here um you know i'm i'm trying to help you and i'm in the going to be in the best position to help you if you're you know completely honest with me and that means telling me telling me you did something you shouldn't have done (laughs) and that's okay um you know it happens uh, the only the only problems that are truly truly unfixable unaddressable are the ones I don't know about. Um, anything else we can strategize around. We can create a plan, um, and that's and that's really you know I think the uh, you know main takeaway from from in, any of that. So yeah, are there situations where um, you know the other side uh, you know may raise some you know raise some evidence or present some evidence that hey, it was a surprise that we just were not expecting. Yeah, absolutely. That happens. Um, 
You just have to raise it with the client. Say, hey, this is unexpected. Here it is. And uh, let's talk about how to deal with it. I'm going to ask you uh, to share with me your strategy for when a client walks into your office and this is, you know, more more than likely it's probably a, a corporate client. They walk into your office and from the minute they lay out the case for you, you know, the best thing for them is to settle. Right. Um, how do you do you is that the kind of thing where you want to bring it up early in the case? Because, you know, maybe the client, let's say the client is. I'm not going to call them naive, but they don't understand the depth of the, you know, the material that the other side has, or they don't understand the depth of the hole they've dug themselves into. And they could be completely straight with you from the beginning, but you know, from your experience, they've, they're in your office, they're, they're going to work with you, but they're telling you this, they're giving you this fact pattern and you know the law and you're like, man, this is, this is not a winner. We're lucky if we get out of this, you know, with, you know, a portion of the business still intact. Do you tell them up front or do you, do you let the case evolve a little bit so that you can make, maybe, maybe it's easier to persuade. I don't, I don't know what's, what's a good strategy for doing that. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's it. Look, it's always a conversation, right? So at the outset of the case, it's it's about defining the terms of victory, um, because you know in a in a criminal case uh, or in a in a you know high stakes civil case, it may be that the best possible outcome is an early settlement or an early plea, something that's going to reduce um, the the harm uh, that's going to happen no matter what. Um, you know, and you can look at that and find out, hey, look, we're in for some pain. Let's talk about how to mitigate that. But it's always, it's an ongoing conversation. And, and at the outset of any case, it's, hey, what, what does a victory look like in these circumstances? You know, we are in this. What is a, what is a win? And sometimes a win is a full victory in court. <laughs> okay. Sometimes that's just not going to happen. Um, and so sometimes a victory means something else. And, and the client may have different priorities. I mean, sometimes the sometimes cases aren't about money. Sometimes it's about uh, you know telling the story, advocating, just getting getting the facts out there. Um, so it really depends. And and yeah, I mean, and, and and like you said, I mean, the the case cases develop, and so the facts tend to change. Um, as you get discovery from the other side, as you kind of learn what's going on. And so when new facts come out that significantly alter the landscape, that's, that's why it's an ongoing conversation. It's like, well, this is something new. And this alters, you know, I think our judgment on um, the case. But, uh, but it's always best to have those, you know, have those um, conversations is an open dialogue. It's like, how does this, this is new information we need to discuss. How does this change our view of the case? What do you think? Here's what I think. Let's come to a, an agreement on what the best path forward is. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to take a minute and think about it. Um, what I want you to share with folks is the kind of the difference in practicing in federal court uh, as opposed to, you know, state court or, you know, a local court or municipal court. I want you to uh, give folks some insight into some of the differences in practicing in federal court. And we'll get into that in just one minute. I need to remind folks who are joining us today that this show and every show is brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. For over 35 years, Sandrowski Corporate Advisors has provided expert client service to people all over the United States. Now, Sandrowski is not just your average run-of-the-mill accounting firm. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find an accounting firm that has deeper expertise in private equity and family office organization and uh, the finances than Sandrowski. You see, they've written books on both of these subjects and they're textbooks, they're books that are used to teach people about the financial ins and outs of both private equity and family offices. Now, why am I talking about this today? Well, 
if you are an individual who is well off, you're let's say you're a high net worth individual and you have significant assets and you want to invest those assets in a way that makes sure that you have complete oversight of your financial situation and you potentially would like to get the inside track legally, the legal inside track on some really good investments, a family office may be for you. Now, a family office is simply a company that's formed to manage your assets, to manage your wealth. There are individual family offices for ultra high net worth individuals, and then there are multifamily offices. So if you're a high net worth individual, and you know, we can define that, but I'll let you define it for yourself. So if you're listening to this and you think, hey, what Dave's saying resonates with me, there's a pretty good chance you're a high net worth individual. You can connect with other families who are in in a similar situation, and you can form a multifamily office, or maybe your family can join a multifamily office and have your assets managed by professionals. Now, where Sandrowski comes in is they can prepare your personal and your company finances if you're an entrepreneur so that when you enter this multifamily office situation, you know exactly where everything is, you know what your contribution to the family office is, and if you want to do your due diligence on the multifamily office before you enter it, have Sandrowski review those financial documents for you. Sandrowski has done this for years. They've written a book on this. It is one of the things they do that makes them different, that makes them unique. They also do business valuations. They will do dispute advisory. They'll do litigation support, forensic accounting, risk management. They do all those sorts of things as well. But the important thing to remember is that Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is a CPA firm with a different perspective. In other words, they work with people for whom their money is almost always in motion. They work with people for whom the stakes are extremely high. So I want you to give them a call at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, as I said, a CPA firm with a different perspective. We're also brought to you by My Revenue Roadmap Guide. If you want to build your book of business, I've got a free resource for you. My Revenue Roadmap Guide is the same business development guide I use with all my clients. And you can get it for free. It's my way of saying thank you for watching us. Thank you for listening to us. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com. Just put all those words together and a .com at the end, revenueroadmapguide.com. Enter your contact info, download your free guide that you can customize to build your book of business today. We're speaking with Gerald Meyer. He is a uh, complex commercial litigation attorney. He's based in Chicago, but he works at a firm that can handle complex commercial litigation matters all over the place, all over the United States. You can reach him at 312-450-6714, 312-450-6714. I'm also going to put his email address and his website in the contacts, um, in the uh, show notes for you so you can contact him whenever you need to. All right. So, Gerald, Explain the difference between uh, handling a case in federal court versus handling a case in state court or maybe even municipal court, circuit court. Sure thing. So, it, you know, at a high level, uh, there there really aren't major differences. But, you know, at a, at a you know, more granular level, there are big, big differences. So I've tried cases in both state and federal court. Um, done you know had had appeals in both state and federal court and uh you know arbitrations are another forum uh to consider there and so uh, you know i'm going to throw that in too because um you know i think that's a, a an important distinction to make but but generally federal courts are a little bit more formal they have a little bit more uniform rules although um you know there are from district to district or circuit to circuit some local rules that change a little bit state courts tend to have um, very uh, rules that are modeled after the federal rules, although that's you know really varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, state courts tend to be a little bit less formal, but look, that doesn't mean you don't you, you get to go to court without wearing a suit uh, or anything like that. Um, there's just a little bit less formality to the practice, um, just slightly. And uh, the the rules are can be a little bit more arcane. They tend to um, be updated a little bit less frequently. They tend to uh, kind of move a little bit, uh, move a little bit more slowly uh, when it comes to updating things. So so really the 
and then and then arbitration is even more informal than state court. Um, you know, of course, again, you're still wearing a suit <laughs> when you appear uh, and everything, so it's not it, it's not like an informal setting. Is there's just a little bit less formality and and even fewer rules uh, in an arbitration forum. Um, you know, generally the rules of evidence don't apply, so there aren't things like hearsay objections. Um, the the arbitrators can kind of let in and take whatever evidence they want. So um, what I've noticed, and, and I think this was made very clear uh, in, in March 2020, um, that the federal courts were more quick to adapt to remote uh, hearings um, and, and kind of keeping the courts moving, at least with respect to civil matters. Um, the state courts took a little bit more time to catch up, although they did. Um, and, and so... You know, when it comes to practicing, uh, you know, when it comes to an attorney's job practicing in state court, federal court, arbitration, really, you want to bring the same kind of high quality um, advocacy, uh, no matter what your forum is. Um, it's not that, you know, one type of argument is going to play in state court that doesn't play in federal court. Um, generally, uh, judges and arbitrators, no matter where they're sitting, um, you know, they want to see <laughs> the same thing that everybody wants to see is clear arguments, um, strong advocacy, uh, you know, and, and credible uh, attorneys, people who are going to take honest positions and, uh, and, and really just make the base, best case for their clients in a very straightforward. Talk about the writing. Is, it, uh, is briefing a case more difficult in federal court than, than it is in, in other forums? Not necessarily. Um, I would say that in the trial level, there, there's more of a distinction between trial level courts and appellate courts than there is between okay. state and federal. Um, so I, I can talk about that distinction a little bit. The, the trial courts, your deadlines, you have smaller page limits, your deadlines are a lot quicker, um, and you're dealing with an open evidentiary record. So. Um, you're you're dealing with a lot more information uh you have to crunch it in a lot less time you're dealing with a judge who's a lot busier um and so you have less of your judge's attention and you really want to get to the main point hammer your strong points um address the major weaknesses and and kind of get out in as concise uh, a brief as you can do now it should still be very high quality it should still be polished well researched clear um you know those those things you should never ever compromise on when you're in the appellate court uh it's it's very very different because you have a closed record um so you're only dealing with uh a certain kind of amount of information you have more time um and you have more uh pages so you have more space to to really express your thoughts express you know really uh, kind of draw out your explanations of the law and so you have a lot more um ability to talk about uh the whys and you know why why is this rule even exist you know what's the point um and what's going to happen in future cases if we uh, go one way as opposed to the other, so you can you can really expand on um, some of the legal principles uh, more so than you can in the trial court, and it's more expected. Now you've uh, you've briefed a few cases for the U.S. Supreme Court. Explain explain how that may even differ from uh, the appellate briefs that you've written. Sure. So, uh, yeah, same same principle applies kind of going up the chain. It's it's even more formal. Um, the quality standards are the highest that they could possibly be. Um, you know, we we always try to produce very, very high quality work product <laughs> free of typos, um, free of error. Um, but in the Supreme Court, um, that's just all the more important. Um, it's it's the show. You know, that's it's the highest court in the land. And, and that's where, you know, kind of all eyes are on you. Mistakes are even more embarrassing <laughs> when they're made in the Supreme Court. So um, really, it's just applying that same kind of process, though, um, to another brief. I mean, very careful, very clear, well-researched and credible. 
Um, and, and I can't stress that enough. You know, it, one thing that really drives me crazy at all levels is when people make, uh, when arguments, they pound on the table, uh, you don't like that. <laughs> exactly. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, the court tends to frown on that too. <laughs> yes. So give us, so what is, uh, what is it like when you're, so you're preparing a brief for the Supreme court. Do you guys like you must there must be several levels of review in the firm and then do you do like a red team where somebody takes the the opposing side and says oh you know I'm going to tear this point apart blah 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 and then you go back and revise what's how do you like internally what's your process for for something like that Yeah of course I mean we really try to apply that process um you know, all the way, whether it's trial court, um, you know, all the way up to the Supreme Court, it's really um, about honing our work product. So there's always somebody who, and, and I try to take that role to play the devil's advocate, to look at our arguments and say, hey, if I'm on the other side, how am I going to tear this apart? And, and that's part of the benefit for us of, of being, acting as both plaintiffs attorneys and defendants attorneys. You know, we're on both sides of the V all the time. So we have exercise kind of both building up a case and tearing one apart. So um, so we do that, we moot our arguments, we have multiple levels of review of uh, you know all of our briefs uh, and that's that's all the way through. At the Supreme Court, you know there is they have very specific um, formatting requirements and things like that. So there's a there's certainly another level of review um, that gets applied to those briefs um, to make sure that we have, um, you know, someone who's really an expert on, you know, what, what is the Supreme Court specifically looking for? And, uh, you know, we run through those, um, through that process as well. And of course we have, you know, since we're before the Supreme Court, um, often, uh, we have a pretty good sense of, um, you know, how we, th you know, what we think is the best way to advocate for a certain position to certain judges. And so part of that practice is predicting, hey, well, we think that three judges are safe on one side. We think three judges are safe on the other side. So really, you know, we're talking to three judges. Um, and who do we think is, who do we think is movable and what do we think is the best way to, you know, really speak uh, to them? That, that, that's maybe if you're an amicus or if you're a supporting party, if you're the main party, you have to like really hit everything. But, um, but we do supporting party briefs um, all the time as well. And so, you, you know, really your, your thought process is, hey, who can I, who can I move? Who can I really speak to um, and, and, and try to get him on, him or her on, you know, our side? And do you, uh, I'm sure you have people in the firm who perhaps have clerked for these folks. Do you pull them in and say, hey, listen, how is, you know, how is Clarence Thomas going to, going to feel about this? Or how is, how is John Roberts going to, going to feel about this? Do you, do you bring them in to get their thoughts on it? Yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. That, and that happens at the Supreme court that happens in the circuit court level. Um, and at the trial court level, you know, we have, um, everybody at our firm has clerked, um, with, with, I think just a couple of exceptions, uh, at the federal level. And so if we have a district court case in front of, you know, uh, a, a judge in the Northern District of Illinois, um, yeah, we're going to we're going to talk to somebody who's worked for that judge. If we're, um, you know, we have an appeal that's in the Fourth Circuit. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be I'm going to consult on that case, even if it's not my case. Um, I'm going to talk about the Fourth Circuit and what I know about those judges and, you know, how I think um a certain panel is likely to. Do okay, case. now let's talk about the real hard work. How do you get these cases? Because these cases are, you know, every every good sized firm wants the cases that you work on. So how do these cases come to you? How do you originate this type of work? Sure. So a lot of it is just developing and establishing a reputation um, in you know in the marketplace for legal services. So uh, thankfully, you know we're a very reputable firm. Um, you know we do have practice before the Supreme Court, and so we do have that reputation. So beyond that, it's um, it's really a lot of word of mouth. Uh, I mean, what we do and and a lot of our business comes from other attorneys. So. A lot of it is just making sure that, hey, we play nicely with others, that when we are, um, you know, litigating, even if, when, you know, it's a contentious case, 
um, you know, our opposing counsel or our opponents, uh, but not enemies. And you know, we play uh, we play fair, and um, you know, we really make sure that uh, we're giving our you know we're giving our best and giving our highest quality you know work product no matter what, and that tends to be respected. Um, so. When it comes to um, you know cases coming in the door, um, you know we are fairly selective um, about the cases that we take, and uh, and it takes a lot of um, you know it takes a lot of advanced kind of work and, and thought uh, when we're deciding hey is this the right case for our firm, um, but really you know it's it's a combination of things and and just kind of getting our name out there and making sure we're consistently doing high quality work, um, consistently talking to people uh, about what we do and about what we offer and uh, and making sure that uh, we keep our standards high as they always are. Okay, and you're, and Gerald, you're pretty early in your in your career, but uh, tell us about something that you're, that you're most proud of. I mean, in a, you know, in a, in a trial lawyer's career, I would imagine that you get some of the really great cases as you, as you, you know, grow in your career and, and later on down the road, but you've done substantial, really great stuff. So what are you most proud of at this point in your career? And then I'll have you on in 10 years and you can tell us a different story. Sure thing. I, you know, it's, it's hard to pick just one moment, but look, there's, there's nothing, nothing competes with having your name on a Supreme court brief. I mean, that's just a, um, you know, tremendous honor to, to even be in that situation. Um, especially when, uh, you know, your brief, uh, is on the winning side. Uh, so that's very, very helpful, uh, which, uh, you know, we've now had a couple times. So, um, so being able to, being able to write a, you know, Supreme court brief, put my name on it and, uh, you know, and win the case, um, that's, you know, we won one, I, I guess the, my first merits brief, uh, that had my name on it was, uh, an eight zero decision with one justice. Wow. Review. That's great. So, um, it was like, yeah, it's a unanimous decision. I mean, it, it, it's really, it's hard to beat yeah, listen, I'd take it. That's fantastic. Yeah, you're uh that's that's a that's a really really nice um uh, highlight to uh to a career that continues to grow and continues to improve. So along those lines, what are you most excited about say in the next, you know, year or or 2 years? What is what is what is, you know, everybody has something that they're looking forward to. Most of us, you know, it's probably a vacation or something. What are you most excited about? I mean, you know, set aside personal, you can tell us about personal if you want, but from a, you know, from a career perspective, what are you most excited about for the next 12 to 24 months? Sure. Well, look, the legal landscape is always changing and, and it's and it can be very hard to predict. And, and I think, you know, you saw this in the Great Recession um, and we're seeing it again with COVID that, it, you know, I think that there's this expectation that, um, you know, things like bankruptcy uh, were going to blow up and, and it didn't really happen. And so and, and it hasn't happened yet. I mean, it remains to be seen whether it will. Um, but it's one of those things where, um, you know, I think the conventional uh, wisdom uh, is often wrong. Uh, and so, you know, what I'm excited about is trying to, you know, stay nimble, uh, making sure that we are in a position to, um, you know, to, to move where the market's moving really before it gets there. Um, and I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, we're seeing this with the supply chain issues that are really, you know, kind of at the forefront. Now, you know, there, there's going to be you know, litigations over some of these deals. Um, and I think that that's really a lot more, um, you know, where things are headed rather than the bankruptcy front or even really the securities fraud front. I mean, these are these are things where, um, you know, nobody's really sure what's going to happen. I, I think we're going to see a lot of transaction disputes, um, you know, specifically things that have been affected by the supply chain crisis. Um, and, and I do a fair amount of securities work too. And, and something that's been very, very interesting um, is seeing the SPAC mm. explosion, you know, over the last couple of years. And, and some, um, you know, there's, there's so much enthusiasm for them in the marketplace um, that uh, it's really kind of unclear, <laughs> you know, how, how much, um, you know, the money going into these things is really meritorious. And, you know, look, when there's when there's kind of a new product coming out on the market um, and, and a new way of doing things and people are excited about it, um, look, there's fraud yeah. in every industry um, and kind of new products coming out there. I mean, that's that's attracts fraudsters. So, you know, there's certain to be 
um, a lot of litigation, you know, both criminal and civil, um, you know, surrounding um, those things. So I'm keeping I, an eye on I that. think you're I think you're spot on there. I would I would put a microscope on the SPAC market because that is that screams to me credit default swap. That is like credit default swap territory. And I don't mean, you know, I mean, you know, brand new. It's not brand new, but a, a product that is being used uh, for a purpose that it most likely was never intended to be used for. And the, cl the most clever people, the people who are out in front of that are always the fraudsters. <laughs> the fraudsters always get there first and then the law catches up with them down the road. So, and when the law catches up with them, Gerald Meyer, you'll be there. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> I love that. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to think about three things that you want folks to take away from our time together. I'll give you a minute to do that because I want to remind folks that we are brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. If you think something's going on and it's a little fishy, you need to call Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. Let me give you an example. So you and your partner have been working together for years and years and years. Your partner handles the books and the business and you decide you're gonna split up. And now you have to figure out what the business is worth. Well, your partner says it's worth X, but you think it's worth X plus 100. What do you do? Well, you're gonna get a lawyer and it's gonna get contentious, but I think what you should do is you should say, hey, listen, these guys, Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, they've been valuing businesses for years. I think we should bring them in, let them just open the books up, let them look at the books and let them give us a value on the business. Similarly, if you're going to buy a business, let's say you're expanding, things are going great for you and you wanna buy a business and the person selling the business says it's worth X and you're like, well, I'm not really sure. I'm happy to pay that if it's what it's worth. Bring in Sandrowski, let them look at the business, let them do a business valuation. They've been doing this for 35 years. You can reach out to Sandrowski Corporate Advisors by calling 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. One six zero seven Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. They're a CPA firm with a different perspective. We're also brought to you by my Revenue Roadmap Guide. You heard me say it before. You need to build your book of business. I can help you with a business development plan. Download the Revenue Roadmap Guide and customize it for your practice. It's my gift to you to thank you for being here. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info, download your free business development plan today. All right, Gerald, what should we take away from our time together? You gave us so much to think about. Give us three really important things that we should take away from our time together today. Sure thing. Look, I mean, if, if you're in the market for uh, legal services from a litigator, um, you're, you're in that unfortunate position because uh, <laughs> nobody really wants to be there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do. I think there are three things that are really important for you. And, and the first one is you know, be a realist, be a realistic and define the terms of victory, you know, kind of early on and be open to changing that. Um, you really need to think hard about what do I want to get out of this litigation or if I'm being sued, um, you know, what can I do about this? You know, what's, what does a win look like to me? Um, and, and again, you know, the landscape changes throughout litigation. So be open to revising um, you know, that definition as things progress. Um, you know, two, you want to work with an attorney who, you know, understands you, understands your business, understands your problems. It you know, really kind of gets to know you, gets to understand you and wants to build that trust. You know, having a trust between an attorney and a client is really indispensable. Um, th there's nothing, you know, you can do about it. If you can't build that trust, there's no way to, um, you know, really replace that, you know, replicate it in any other way. And and then three, you want to make sure you're working with somebody who has the, you know, that they're going to define, you know, they're going to define victory with you and, and be open to revising that along the way. Um, you know, they're going to get to know you, understand you um, and, and build a, you know, trustful relationship with you. And then three, somebody who has the ability to do you know, what you need them to do. Um, the, the this job's not for the faint of heart um, it's it's uh, it is a high stress high stakes um, you know profession and uh, you need to work with someone you're comfortable with and somebody who can you know go to the mat for you when you need to somebody who can pull you back from the edge when that's needed um, really somebody who's going to exercise and help you exercise um, you know your very best judgment in a really high stakes um, scenario. Um, so those are those are the three things that I would uh, I would strongly recommend that uh, anyone who uh, you know finds themselves on the market for some 
uh, for a litigator uh, think about and consider. It. Fantastic. Great advice. Thank you, Gerald. I really appreciate it. If you need to reach out to Gerald Meyer, you can do so by calling 312-450-6714, 312-450-6714. I'm also going to put his email address in the show notes. I'm going to put his bio in there as well. It's a, it's a fantastic bio, so enjoy reading it just like I did. Gerald, thank you so much for being here. It was wonderful having you. You really uh, helped us understand the judicial process from the inside. So thank you for giving us the inside BS on the judicial process. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. All righty, folks, that'll do it for this episode of the Inside BS Show. We're back here every day with another show for you. We'll have another great interview for you tomorrow. My guest today was Gerald Meyer. If you want to reach out to him, you can call him at 312-450-6714, 312-450-6714. Thanks to Gerald Meyer. Thanks to Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. And thanks to you for listening and for watching. We'll be back here again tomorrow. Until then, here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.